Okay. Welcome everybody. So we have um, this session on data-driven methods applied to, to energy systems. Um, so the first presentation is from Roald Dog. It's a postdoc and AI Now Institute at New York University. In fact, he's starting a new position as assistant professor at the Delft University of Technology. He has a PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences from the Berkeley University. And his areas of interest, it's control and intelligent systems, data-driven planning and operation, integration and societal of environmental applications of data-driven technologies. So I give the floor now to, to Hall. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and then to present our work. Um, I'll dive right into, so we'll be talking about learning to control and power systems with a strong emphasis on safety, safety challenges, safety problems. Um, I'll start by showing the team. This is a collective work by four, uh, the four of us at the top. Um, we're, we're all PhD students at Berkeley, now in various places. Um, Patricia and I spearheaded this paper. Uh, Patricia is currently starting a, uh, as a faculty, a faculty position at UC San Diego. And the three advisors at the bottom uh, were grateful for their for their commitment to keep uh, keep supporting us uh, and this work is really been kind of bringing together um, like a lot of uh, our individual kind of experiences dealing with um, control systems in, in power and energy and dealing with uh, issues of safety so um, the idea of the smart grid has been around for a while it's an old idea um, IEEE Transactions of Smart Grid has been around for 10 years with a wealth of ideas developed so far. However, um, while um, artificial intelligence and machine learning have experienced major investments in the last decade, we can't really uh, conclude that the smart grid has taken full effect, at least the promises of it. So these data-driven technologies, they have been named to transform um, the utility space in terms of, um, one second, In terms of billing and customer services, uh, we've seen lots of uh, action around predictive maintenance and perhaps most ambitiously, uh, quote unquote, AI has been named endlessly as the key towards designing self healing grids. But why hasn't Alexa figured out how to balance the, uh, the grid yet? Of course, there are many other factors than just thinking about uh, power systems and, and computation that are involved in enabling uh, the smart grid and, and enabling the promise uh, of artificial intelligence. Um, too many factors to, to discuss today. Today we focus on some concrete safety problems in learning how to control in power systems. And our, our paper addresses this ambition in various contexts, including frequency regulation, voltage regulation, demand response and system dispatch. Uh, we can cover all that ground today. So let's stick with a, a running example. So let's consider the challenge to coordinate an increasingly richer set of distributed energy res resources, DERs in short. Um, by programming the inverter interfaces to not just uh, serve the local owner of the, of the DER, but also provide some form of ancillary service to the local distribution system operator. For instance, to, to deal with increasing levels of uh, renewable uh, integration, as well as the electrification of the grid. Um, and for now, consider doing this in a learning-based way. So ideally, uh, this would be decentralized. So every DER uh, somehow uses machine learning to figure out a policy that can serve the grid. And potentially, these can, can talk with each other. So the key question here, uh, once we've come up with an idea like this, is what could go wrong? Like, how does, it, does this really work in practice? And what, uh, what safety challenges do we face? Well, AI systems have proven to be inherently vulnerable. They're prone to errors, attacks, and incorrect use. And recently, various fatal accidents have, have shown us that there is a, a broad variety of harms that have come with the, the emergence of, uh, of this technology. These harms are both physical and non-physical, and often disp disproportionately experienced by un underrepresented groups in society. So if we're really honest, uh, looking at the accident reports of some of these cases, we will see that engineering design alone won't save us. Um, and we need to, to look much more broadly at how to organize these systems, how to think about safety culture, for instance. 
Um, and these concerns are, they, they're emerging in this paper as well. This is, this is also meant to be somewhat of a holistic view. However, uh, as a power system computation community deeply committed, or deeply invested in building these kinds of technologies uh, that may turn out to be harmful to people or the environment, uh, we, we bear a responsibility to understand the safety implications of our work. And so let's focus on our, our, on our own piece of the puzzle first. So what we do is, uh, in this paper is we cover a set of concrete safety problems inspired by former work in the AI community, um, starting um, from the ways in which we formulate, validate, and integrate uh, these technologies. We will discuss what we deem uh, as con concrete problems. This is a non-exhaustive list, uh, which forms a starting point to then expand our study and development of learning-based control. Uh, given, we give some examples uh, in, in this particular case study, we have more examples in the paper, and then I will uh, quickly kind of flash the guidelines. There are too many to, to discuss today. Um, and then, um, yeah, we move on to questions. So let's jump into concrete problems. So I'll discuss four of them. The first one is avoiding negative side effects. Um, so an, a machine learning model optimizes its actions uh, according to an objective function that may not be able to capture all the behaviors to keep a system safe. So what potential side effects can we expect and can we account for these in formulating the learning problem? And in the context of coordinating DERs, as I introdu uh, introduced earlier, you can ask the question, how could learning-based controllers respect constraints? Respecting constraints is generally a very uh, challenging problem with machine learning systems, AI systems. So how would you do that in the context of such a safety critical um, system? The second concrete problem that we talk about is persistent excitation and safe exploration. The questions here are what data is needed, what experimental conditions are needed, to ensure that the learned parameters uh, result in safe behavior in practice. Um, and if you are doing some form of online learning or reinforcement learning, what safety mechanisms are available or can we come up with to prevent unsafe exploration scenarios? Um, and a question in the context here would be to say, what if my learning-based controller destabilizes power flow? Because especially when it is an online procedure, we know that there are um, by itself, no, no, no strong guarantees for, um, you know, the behavior of the system going, going into a territory that we don't, that we want to prevent. Um, the third problem we discuss is robustness to distributional shift. So how do we make sure a machine learning model recognizes or is robust to changes in, you know, the variables that it relies on, um, in the distribution of the variables that it relies on. And how do we ensure that the model's own control actions do not cause detrimental distributional shift? And we'll get back to that in a, in a second. Um, a, a particular question here could be, how about you know, new devices connecting or certain devices disconnecting from the grid, which you know, in the context of um, distribution system operation is a very, uh, it's a very big problem. Things change all the time, things modernize, electrify, um, and it's hard to capture um, all, all of that in, in historical data and keep up. And so how do you, <clears throat> how do you mitigate those risks? Um, the third, fourth and last problem uh, is safe integration in legacy systems and practices. So how do we ensure that a human operator can safely override or complement the actions of the learning-based control scheme? And how do new learning-based controllers interact with and complement existing legacy control mechanisms. We won't be able to replace our infrastructure uh, with something that, that, that works fully automated. We'll, we want to keep relying on the knowledge and expertise of human, human operators and existing control uh, systems in order to keep our system safe. And so the, this is a critical, a critical challenge. So one particular question you could ask here is what happens if I you know, have these control D, um, these DER controllers that have been trained uh, through a machine learning procedure, I implement them, they seem to work, but then I start to say change, you know, low tap change your settings or some other control system, what happens, what can go wrong? And let's, let's stay with that example and look at that um, in, a, in, the, in this context of this case study. So uh, learning based, uh, so learning fully decentralized policies for electric uh, grid control, is that possible? Um, there's some, some work that uh, in our team that we've done earlier to, 
to show how that is possible, I'll give a, a, a very quick introduction to what, to what it entails. So here we have like three major steps. First, we, we start with the model of the system. So we're in a centralized setting. We have a model, we have historical data, say around consumption, generation, demand, but it can also be temperature and other uh, weather uh, information. Uh, we run you know, the variables and the model through an optimal power flow scheme to um, complement it with, the, with all the uh, optimal set points that come out of, uh, out of that power flow OPF procedure. With that, uh, we then split up this larger centralized data set into smaller uh, local data sets for every DER. And every DER now, uh, for every DER, we apply machine learning to come up with a, a function that tries to generalize, that tries to mimic the behavior that it, that it has within the optimal power flow scheme. And so now I have these, let's say if I have 20 uh, DERs, I have these 20 local machine learning um, or learning based controllers, I implement them in the network and collectively they, they mimic the optimal power flow scheme. And so just to give you a quick result uh, to see what, what, what this can do, you can, for instance, minimize, minimize voltage variation. So in this case, at the top, we see uh, the value of the voltage throughout a network and throughout time um, in the red uh, shaded region. Um, and we see that's without control. And at the bottom, we see the learning based control scheme is basically able to, to flatten the voltage throughout the network and, and throughout time. So that's not the point of this. The point is then to ask the question, what if I, if I have this result? So now I have that result at the top, if I flatten the voltages, can I actually uh, bring in uh, still basically play around or use the, the load tap change of settings to, for instance, to lower the voltage uh, collectively throughout the network. Um, this could, you know, looks like something like con uh, conservation voltage reduction. Um, and the, the point here is that it's, it really depends how you, how you design your system. And we, we tried this in the beginning and we were not able to do it. And we saw there were lots of interactions and issues uh, with the, the local controllers interacting uh, and being coupled with, with the, the load depth changer. So, uh, the issue here is that closing a loop causes distributional shift. So if your controllers rely on dynamical state variables X to compute a control signal U that goes back into the system, by virtue of, of it being a feedback controller, it will change the distribution of the dynamical state variables X that it used previously um, to, to, to be trained. So the key guideline here is to think about whether you, uh, to think about these spatial dynamics that include the load that changer and the controllers itself. And um, one way to, to mitigate this is to use a, a predictive feed forward controller that does not cause such a distributional shift. Here, instead of relying on the dynamical state variables such as voltage, so you don't, you put voltage aside and you only look at exogenous uh, disturbance variables, D, as an, as an input to your controller and as, as, as such as an input to your machine learning procedure. And this uh, basically um, overcomes this issue. That, so there's no more um, dynamical coupling between the controllers and also between the controllers and, and existing um, legacy control systems and um, operators potentially like coming in and doing a manual, um, making manual changes. So I, I'm seeing I'm running out of time. So I'm going to uh, push forward to uh, to the guidelines. So this was just a narrow example to show you. Like it takes a lot of kind of you know work to address some of these these problems, and we've done that across these different application areas. And uh, we have lots of different examples in the paper that we hope uh, may inspire you to to think about how you can use machine learning and to, to do that in a way that addresses safety concerns. Uh, these guidelines. Uh, We've categorized them along a problem formulation, empirical validation, and uh, what we call socio-technical integration. Um, so I'll just kind of flesh them quickly. In problem formulation, uh, apart from a variable partitioning that I was just talking about, uh, there's an example in the paper talking about stability guarantees for closed loop. So if you do want to do closed loop, this is a, like an, a good case study to see what you, uh, how you can address those issues of, of stability and, and, and dynamical coupling. Um, in validation, we have, um, you know, these three, I'll, I, I think I, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to show them. You can ask questions if you want. Um, and then lastly, there's 
like I said earlier, there are many other factors involved in safety. And there is also a paper that um, I'm working on at the moment that tries to get, get at those. So that's food for thought in the future. So with that, I, I also basically discussed our takeaways. I'll, I'll just thank you here and invite, invite you to, yeah, ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ro. Um, so we have already one one Q one question in the Q and A. Uh, in fact, it's a comment, but it raises a quite interesting question. Uh, so the comment is that I don't think that we have evidence that an AI system are eminently more vulnerable than other kinds of systems. So I don't know if you want to comment on this because it's true that we also have systems that are more mathematically based are not data driven but they are also an approximation of the physical system so do you want to comment on this yeah that, i think that's a that's definitely a valid question uh, the, a lot of these concerns hold for whatever like whatever um, you know uh, control scheme you you develop um our emphasis has been on machine learning systems i'm currently working on a report talking about uh, AI vulnerabilities. What I can say is that for uh, some of the more sophisticated like model classes, such as deep learning, there are adva lots of advances in making them more robust against errors, against attacks, but there's no um, kind of security by design solution yet. Um, I, you know, I, I can't comment on, on all the other control schemes that are out there. I, there, there's probably like I would have to do the work to to understand like how that compares to uh, to other schemes. That so I it's a valid question I would say, and I'd love to yeah to have a an offline discussion to learn more about potential ideas that people have. Okay, so since we don't have your questions, I have a personal uh, question. So you mentioned in your your paper about extreme events. Uh, you mentioned online learning. Uh, but when I read that, I was thinking in a work that was done on the Electra project where they divided, um, for the future control centers, they divided these in two cases. So using AI for normal operation and using human operators when you have extreme events. So somehow when you have a critical situation, you still have to rely on humans uh, and humans will make the decisions and not, not any autonomous system. Um, so are you considering to include this in this framework that you were proposing for the safety? So cases where a human can override what the autonomous system is, is deciding? Yes, so it's, it kind of comes up in the, the last slide I showed about like revisiting these concrete problems because we, our work has been inspired by that paper. It's I think it's from 2015. However, that was written by people that are more squarely in the AI, the technical community. They've done a really great job to think about issues that come up in like the technical formulation of systems. But our recent research shows that, you know, in the end, there are lots of cases where if you make systems more autonomous, look at the Boeing, for instance, the Boeing example that um, I showed earlier on. Like you need human, like you, you really need to rely on humans sometimes, or at least if something goes wrong, there needs to be a way for humans to, to intervene and override. And we discussed that in the paper a bit. So actually this example, like thinking about um, open loop controllers can actually make it much easier for an operator to come in, because in the end, what you're doing is instead of responding to changes constantly in, in the voltage, for instance, you're just looking at, okay, what's the temperature? What am I using? Uh, locally, and as as such, um, you're just reshaping the, the the nodal profiles throughout the network. So you're not really making it harder for uh, an operator to like. It's not that the operator suddenly is like, "Oh shit, I I can't touch this because I don't know what all these local controllers are going to do." That you can actually simulate them. You can, um, I think, you can actually still use them in a context where you need to intervene uh, with with um, manual like with a manual action. So, but again, I think there's a lot more work to be done at the intersection of, I would call it like human computer interaction and safety machine learning in various domains. Power systems is a very important one. Okay, thank you. So we have time for one quick question, and quick answer. So there is one here. Uh, who are the users of this AI scheme you propose? So utility aggregator, device maker? Yeah, uh, interesting question. I would say that Throughout the years I've been working in this space, 
I had the most fruitful kind of interactions and collaborations with um, utility uh, companies or distribution system operators um, personally, right? So I've worked mostly in distribution. Um, those were in, in, in Europe, um, especially those that have been investing in their infrastructure and that are kind of ready to, to experiment with these more sophisticated forms of control. And then you have other players like, um, you know, device owners, or you have people like companies like well, Tesla that acquired Solar City, who've also been, we're also thinking about these schemes. I think the economics uh, at the distribution level are harder um, for those more commercial efforts, but you can see them at the at the level of ancillary services in the transmission grid. There's many, you know, there's a very big ecosystem of commercial okay. layers. Um, yeah. Thank you.